the traditional custodians of the country that I am on today and to acknowledge Indigenous peoples in all the places that we are situated and their long histories of caring for country and each other and the living environment and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. And hopefully the increasing importance of Indigenous knowledges as we continue along our paths and our journeys in life on this planet. Thank you so much. On that note, I'd like to really take a moment to give everyone a really warm welcome to this Region 101 Dialogue Exploring Intersectionality series. Um, for those of you who were here with us over the past few weeks, you may notice that we're taking a more expansive approach to some of the topics that we've been discussing. Um, and a lot of that was because of some of the feedback that we received from the participants at the end of our sessions in the breakout room. So we're really thankful for those conversations. Over the past few weeks, we've really dived deep. We've looked at topics such as ecofeminism and environmental law, uh, kind of the history of rights-based politics, uh, earth emotions. It's been pretty expansive. Um, but before we even begin our conversation today, there is a reminder that these are difficult conversations to be having, especially in this time on the planet right now. Um, and each of us are entering this conversation with very different entry points. You know, we say in the Region 101 um, series that on a scale of zero to 100, we're all somewhere along the spectrum, especially when it comes to different topics. So we welcome that diversity here. And it's an acknowledgement to doing better from now on that we have had maybe not as much control of where we've come from, but we have full control about how we are going forward. And that's something we'd like to carry and acknowledge in this space. Um, and so I'm just going to drop into the chat a couple of group rules about how we want to agree to be together within this space, just to really kind of facilitate our conversation today and to really learn to the best of our abilities. Um, with that kind of framing, I would really, I'm super excited to welcome Yin today. And I'm just going to share a little bit more for those of you who haven't had a chance to um, read the bio that we had shared earlier. Um, so Yin is a Wakaya man who is a professor in race relations at Deakin University. He conducts research on the health, social and economic effects of racism, as well as anti-racism theory, policy and practice across diverse settings including online, in workplaces, schools, university, housing, the arts, and health. He also teaches and undertakes research in indigenous knowledges. Um, and on that note, I'm so excited to be speaking with you today, Yin. We're, we're really excited, and I think there's no one better that we could be speaking to today on some of the intersecting topics of race and decolonization and climate justice. And um, maybe to just kind of kick things off, and I know this is a really big question, but um, it would be great to hear from your perspective uh, the explicit connection that exists between colonization and the climate crisis, because I think often people don't realize what that connection is, or it's not talked about enough, I will say. Mm, yeah. Well, the deeper story there really is that um, the way that we as humans have become disconnected from our brothers and sisters, the other living creatures of the planet and, and the living planet itself. This is, this is the most, the simplest way to explain colonization. That's the basis of colonization essentially is uh, a disconnect, an idea of separability of human exceptionalism that brings us to create a whole range of social configurations and institutions which essentially exploit and um, destroy our ecosystems uh, without us seemingly noticing these things happening in ways that are invisibilized and that allow that destruction to continue in uh, increasingly uh, intense cycles. And so 
that's really our way of being, knowing and doing in the world, drawing from colonization and coloniality and, and ideas of modernity that have created the situation where we have, you know, carbon, too much carbon in the atmosphere is a, is a simple way to look at it. But uh, obviously we're also in the midst of a six mass extinction, which is nothing particularly to do with carbon at all. It's a separate issue. It's in many ways um, a more fundamental issue, which is about um, taking more than we give essentially. And uh, we're getting to that point where the planet can no longer uh, regenerate in the face of our ongoing selfishness. And that's what colonization is about, taking more than we give. And in many ways also giving too much uh, waste. So we take resources more than we give. We give too much waste for the planet to cope with. And this is the root of all the problems that we have at the moment. So it's a little bit bigger than uh, just naming climate change and just naming uh, the many fold increase in background extinction rates, getting deeper to the reasons why those things have been happening and continue to happen without um, any sense of um, the deep trauma that's been done in the process. Yeah, thank you for that. I really feel like it's really important to name this not just as a carbon problem, right? It's, it's fundamentally about our relationship to all living beings and our relationship to the planet and that you name that disconnection and the extraction, which is really the opposite of regeneration, which is what we're often talking about within XR is so clear. Mm. So thank you for really making that so explicit. Um, you shared with us a little bit earlier and we're going to definitely share with the rest of our crew your paper uh, Unsettling Truths, Modernity, Decoloniality and Indigenous Futures. And it's a wonderful paper and I would love to encourage everyone to read it. Um, but I think there was one moment that really stuck out to me, which is kind of outlining the path forward. You talk about seeking justice outside of the settler colonial state. Um, and what mm. I'm really curious about is if you could talk a little bit more about that and what that might mean for a movement or any people um, in how we conceive of justice or any movement away from this extractive way of living. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm increasingly um, divesting from the notion of justice. I think justice is a very much a modern concept, very much a settler state concept, very much a patriarchal concept, actually. Uh, and I think that it doesn't serve us very well. When we talk about justice, it seems to me that we're drawing on a centuries long tradition and the meaning that underpins the, the, the etymology of the word justice is about things like balancing, about things like objectivity, reason, rationality, and also fundamentally a sense of uh, rewards, uh, punishment, fairness, those who are worthy and those who are not worthy. And the classic image of justice, which is in a feminine form, but I think very much a form that's um, created by patriarchal systems of, you know, someone holding uh, balance scales with blindfolds on. This, this really is, is not working for me. I, I don't think it's what we want. I don't think we want justice. I think what we want is actually healing. And if we think about the predicaments, the situations that we're in from a healing lens, we'll come up with very different responses to those predicaments than if we think about them from a justice lens. Yeah, wow, thank you. I feel like that's a really helpful, almost paradigm shift, right, in the way that we're having these conversations and what that means for when things are broken or need to be repaired within our movements or in our relationship to the planet and all living beings that we center healing um, instead and recognize the roots of justice as actually very colonial and patriarchal. Um, 
I think maybe on a very practical note, it's really helpful to talk about in these dialogues um, different ways in which we can model allyship um, or even talk about the concept of allyship because I think it's a very frequently used term, right? For those of us who are in positions of privilege that it's a moment for us to demonstrate uh, allyship or to do better. Um, and I'm wondering what does that look like in practice or in practical terms uh, in relation to decolonization in racial justice, which I know are really big questions and will probably look different in different parts of the world, but maybe where you're situated, it would be curious to hear how you think of some of these things. Yeah. I think that often people uh, think of decoloniality and, and the kind of personal allyship uh, in that behaviours and responses that might be entailed in that. Uh, too much in a kind of a um, an other other focused way, so a way that's kind of um, often mired in identity politics, and often about what can I do to help somebody else, whether it's racial minorities or women or whatever it might be, in terms of the ism that you're working on. And it's not focused enough on what we are ourselves, our being and our becoming and our way of knowing and doing things. So coloniality is deeply enmeshed in our lives. And it's not just a matter of the sort of question that gets asked, you know, in the sort of work that I do. What can we do to help Aboriginal people? This sort of question. It's, it's the wrong question to ask. The question is, how am I and my life in my life enmeshed in colonial ways of existing? And what can I do about those ways? And often part of that doesn't come with, a, with an answer, an immediate answer that, you know, how can I help? And here are the dot points of that. It's more about reflecting and investigating and also the sort of deep listening that we already talked about as one of the ground rules for this session. What can I do that involves deeply listening to the rhythms of the world? What am I missing in my life where I'm so focused on clock time and when my next meeting's on and what's going to happen tomorrow? But where, what are the rhythms of the world that I'm not sensing here that I could sense if I stopped? If I, in a sense, went slowly enough to see other pathways of existence opening up before me you know sensing those things not just seeing but sensing with all my all my being and what sort of I, what sort of patience does that bring what sort of space does that open to allow other beings in to what i'm doing you know so it's 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 about you but it's also about you in resonance with many other manifold forms of life and it's not a question, how can I help somebody else? What am I actually doing practically? I don't want to be too esoteric about this, but what am I practically doing every day that continues to reinforce coloniality? You know, And how can I do something differently that undermines the conditions of possibility for colonialism? We want to undermine not just directly, but the, the, the foundations that continue to support. You know, Is it the line of work I'm doing? Is it the way I consume? Is it the way that I take up space in hierarchical, oppressive manner that other people find um, uh, silences them? Um, is it something to do with owning things? Do I own too many things that other people don't have access to that they need to live a, a thriving life? What are the institutions that I support in what I do every day? And are those institutions actually uh, places of... Um, healing, places of uh, creation, places of um, vitality, or are they actually places that are part of the destruction of the planet that continues in many thousands of small ways every day. So it's, it is a bit uh, of tapping into the sacred, but it's also extremely practical uh, examination of what we do every day that contributes or undermines the sort of world that we want to see, we want to be in, in the future. Oh, thank 
thank you. Um, I'm really sitting with the fact that you've presented us the two sides of the same coin almost, the sacred and the practical are actually deeply intertwined. And it's really about almost the questions that we're asking. Because I feel like almost saying that do this or do that is reinforcing the coloniality. It's, it's almost the self-reflexivity and the deep listening that is the only way that we can move forward. It's less about what we do or don't do. It's more about how we do it and what questions we ask of ourselves is what I'm hearing you say which is so yes. powerful. We, we need to have that, that radical humility, which allows us to know that we don't even have the right questions yet, let alone answers. Thank you. Yeah. Radical humility. I feel like that's something to hold on to deeply as we move forward. Um, I guess maybe this is a, a question that I think I've heard often and I have often of myself as someone who, despite, you know, growing up uh, in, Singapore and India, you know, two post-colonial nations, very different, um, that I, you know, still inherit and inhabit a lot of settler identities. You know, I, I don't come from First Nations peoples. And so I think the question always is, what are some, what are, what, not just what do we need to learn from Indigenous ways of knowing, because that is clear already, but what, how are the ways in which we can approach that learning in ways that is not replicating coloniality? Or, or what does it mean to be in good relationships? with uh, our, our First Nations people and Indigenous peoples in the world? Yeah, well, I guess the, the danger is always um, of coloniality is always the kind of co-option of Indigenous peoples in, in various ways. Um, so co-option of symbols, co-option of um, knowledges that then become kind of consumed and transformed um, within the machine of modernity into something that's no longer recognisable uh, with, in terms of its, uh, its ontological, you know, roots, its epistemological roots. Uh, so that's the danger. And the way to avoid that, I think, is to, once again, to kind of go slowly, you know. We, we should all be, um, I guess, enjoying the dense thickness of, of the now that we live in, the eternal now in many ways. And that involves not rushing through things, not sort of, you know, I've read that book now on Indigenous knowledges, so I'm all up, I'm up with that now. You know, it's, it's a matter of coming back to those sort of questions that are raised in, in, these, um, in these cosmologies and what they mean. And so in many ways, it doesn't even have to involve... Um, some sort of uh, close connection with Indigenous peoples. It, it can involve making those those um, changes in your life to to promote the health of um, the world that Indigenous people that we as Indigenous people hold so dear. You know. So what, as I say in my paper, I think it's really important to focus on how non-Indigenous people can care for country. You know, what, what do you do to care for country? And not just the country that's around you, but the impacts that your actions have around the, that have reverberate around the world. You know, in these, in these um, colonial countries with these um, extremely long global supply chains, what we do impacts everywhere. And we need to understand that. And we need to make peace with what happens and by make peace, I mean, come to terms with and then radically transform what happens when, for example, we buy a mobile phone. You know, what, what is the suffering that goes into that phone, that smartphone? And how is that okay? And how can we do something that's not about suffering, that's about healing? So there's, there's, those are the sorts of things I'm talking about. It's, it's about um, not so much um, a surface dressing of indigeneity, but a deep coming to terms with what uh, becoming indigenous means on our planet. It means radically different ways of organizing economics and society. It means um, creating caring societies, healing societies, societies that are about um, a 
allowing human potential to flourish. And we don't live in those societies. So that means that that's the work we need to do. It's not just a matter of, um, it's not a matter even of necessarily working directly on indigenous rights. You know, you don't have to be out there uh, protesting for land rights. You know, that's, it's still surface level stuff. You need to go deeper to what are the notions of property and ownership that create the need for us to be protesting for indigenous land rights in the first place. That's what I'm talking about. So you don't have to help indigenous people directly is what I'm saying. You can help indirectly by becoming something other by becoming something that is deeply inimical to coloniality and then multiplying that through your influence to the millions until, you know, coloniality has no um, sustenance anymore. It's starved. It withers away from the lack of engagement from by the people and the other living networks on this planet. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hearing again and again, it's that deeper level of kind of, as you were saying, it's not just about making peace or the way you also define the making peace is the recognition and then the deep transformation, which is what each of us need to be doing. Um, and yeah, I think it's very important for folks to hear that there's so many different entry points into, into decolonization work. It's not just about land rights, right? It's It's about a much deeper sense of consciousness about how do we move in this planet? Like what are our notions, as you were saying, of property ownership, of possession, um, of kind of even material well-being? What, what does that look like? It's, it can all be challenged. Um, I think what would be helpful maybe since we are kind of within an Extinction Rebellion space right now is to maybe hear about the kinds of thoughts and lessons that we need to be applying not just as individuals in our own right, but um, as a movement, because I think this is a very fair and often criticism of exile, you know, largely Europe originating in Europe, you know, I think different local groups have really led the way of showing what different imaginations of the same movement can look like. But I think it would be really helpful to hear as climate movements, how do we kind of center decoloniality and what does that mean? Is that something that we have to proclaim on the streets or is it more about deep inner strategy or something else entirely? Well, I, I think first of all, it's important to say that um, the rise and the rapid growth and the flourishing of XR is, uh, is a very important part of the ecology of social movements that we need at the moment. Um, but it seems to me, and others have made this critique in long extended essays and so forth, that Extinction Rebellion um, is essentially a movement of privileged people, uh, at least this is how it originated, who are scared that their comfortable, entitled way of life is under threat. And they don't, it, it's a, in that sense, it's essentially a conservative movement that's about maintaining the status quo. This is what we have now. We don't want that to change. And now we recognize that the threats, the twin threats of um, mass extinctions and climate change, climate uh, global warming is threatening our way of life. Now that doesn't engage with the, um, the already threatened ways of living that exist in most of the world in the global south. It doesn't engage with that. It's not a backdated social movement. It doesn't backdate to 1800, you know what I mean? So it's a newly recognized, you know, we just woke up uh, at 2 p.m. And, and everyone else in the global south was awake at 8 a.m. and we're catching up here. That's the one problem. The second problem is who do we go to to solve the problem that we've identified. We go to the colonial nation states that caused it in the first place. And we ask them to fix it. We ask national governments to fix it. We are threatened, we're privileged people, and we're talking to you as privileged people, and we're telling you that you need to fix it because our way of life is threatened. And these are the people who caused the problem in the first place. 
and and their 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 privilege and all of our privilege in in these colonial nations is underpinned by the conditions that create climate change and the sixth mass extinction. So how can you expect those people to solve the problem? They're not going to solve the problem. They cannot solve the problem. It's impossible for them to solve the problem as the people that they are. The only way to solve the problem, and in fact, we shouldn't be looking for solutions and we shouldn't be talking about problems because these are colonial ways of thinking. The only way to respond to the predicaments that we're in is to radically reconfigure the social and economic and political systems that we exist in. And XR recognises in some ways this, this radical need for transformation in terms of you know, energy use and uh, consumption and extraction, but it doesn't recognise the underpinning rationales for why that happens. You know, There's no talk of, not enough talk, of what does post-growth look like? What does post-capitalism look like? What does um, caring, engaged, kinship relations with life look like? What sort of society do we need? You know, and and so it becomes a matter of the 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 responses to the problem are offset to government and then and and to citizens' assemblies. So we want the population to inform the government and participatory democracy is absolutely important. There's no question that representative democracy is dead and it never worked in the first place. It's been a zombie for many centuries. Participatory democracy is absolutely what we need. But we need, when they talk about those participatory citizens assemblies uh, being informed by experts, most people are not thinking about indigenous experts. They're thinking about climate experts. And the experts you need in there to talk to people are decolonial experts. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are really important things for us to listen to uh, and to internalize deeply. And I think it, if we were to listen to that deeply, it can raise some big fundamental questions about what kind of ecol or as you were saying, what kind of role XR plays in the ecology of social movements, whether the current strategy is what is actually going to be the way forward, uh, or whether it's in fact reproducing these colonial mentalities. Um, as you were mentioning earlier. Um, maybe just on a slightly more hopeful note, well, I don't know, but I, I hear almost visions for future in what you're saying. And what I'm really curious to hear, which I think you talk beautifully about in your paper, is maybe you can present to us a vision of the future that you believe in and that you're kind of working towards and fighting for that maybe others can also get behind in their own way, whether as XR or, or as individuals. And I think that can always, you know, is something worth waking up for every day, as opposed to waking up to, you know, the shocking numbers of carbon that's in our atmosphere, which really doesn't incite much, much action, I think. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, I, I do think that um, there is uh, many things that we can think and be and do that lend, it, lend themselves to hopeful futures, whether we ever achieve those futures or not is not really the point. The point is to try and to be the best you can be in the, in the moment, in the now. So for me, the solution seems to be to rid ourselves of four, what I call the four devastations of modernity. So the first one is debt, which is the basis of, of money. So we exist, we exist now in a capitalist system which is all about money, it's all about capital. And many people don't understand the extent to which that happens. So for example, um, fractional reserve banking. Who knows about fractional reserve banking? If you know about it, then you realize that banks simply make money out of thin air. That's how they operate. So the 90% of the money that you will encounter in circulation is made up by banks. They hold 10% of the amount of money that they lend to people. So money is simply made up and increasingly so, uh, both at the outset and through compound interest, which then forces people who borrow the money to create ever more 
exponentially more money. This is, this is part of the infinite growth of capitalism. We can't have that sort of thing in a future world. We can't have debt of any kind. And we don't need debt of any kind. Even if we have money, we don't need debt. You don't have to, you don't have, to have interest. Interest is something that was made up um, at a certain point in time. And it's a terrible idea. What, what has it got to do with anything? Why should I pay you interest on something that you lend me? You know, if, you lend, if I lend you my mobile phone, do you have to pay me back a mobile phone and a tiny little mobile phone that goes with it? That's interest? No, you just give me the phone back. So what, the, what, is, what is this interesting? It's just another way, along with rent, that the privileged and the wealthy extract resources from those who are not privileged and not wealthy. It's a, it's a resource wealth extraction mechanism that accumulates capital in very, very few and increasingly fewer hands. So we need to get rid of debt. We need to get rid of property. Property is also another way of through violence, in the essence, through violence at the end, that we enforce those who have and those that have not. The only reason why you would somebody would need some of your property is because they don't have enough of their own. They don't have enough for their own survival, their own thriving, their own flourishing. So we are hoarding property that other people need to, to make their lives worth living. And the people who hoard it don't need it. This is about this is about sharing. That's what it's about, you know. So we don't need ideas of property. We don't need institutions. Institutions themselves, and I'm talking about hierarchical uh, organisations that are not mouldable, not changeable not in an ongoing sense, creatable by those who are in those institutions. So I'm talking about institutions that are run by the, once again, run by the few who hoard power. So we see hoarding of, of debt, we see hoarding of property and we see hoarding of power within oppressive hierarchical institutions. And many people know what I mean if they've ever been in the workforce. Uh, having a nice boss is very unusual and even if that boss was a nice person at some point power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so these sort of hierarchical institutions and the and the largest versions of these hierarchical institutions of course are nation states countries they need to go as well we don't we don't need hierarchies hierarchies are part of modernity so what what i think the future should look like is networks and networks of networks of local communities where people live in a place and most of their resources are sourced from that place or the surrounding areas. So most here, a little bit there and, and, and inversely proportional to the distance is how much resources you take. So not long global supply chains, locally sourced resources. They know people in their community and they work with participatory democratic mechanisms to make decisions that affect them. Decisions for and by and with the people. And they work collaboratively in egalitarian ways with their neighbours. And that creates networks of networks of local communities. There's no nation states. There's no institutions. There's only organisations that are run by the people, each the same degree, the people within those organisations. There's no debt and there's no property that's individual. People don't own their own land. They don't own their own houses. That stuff is property. That's in common. Of course, people will have possessions. They may have a phone. But this is not the problem of property. The problem is the large scale capture of resources, not the small items that you can carry on your person or that you can fit in your backpack or perhaps the boot of your car. This is not the problem. You don't get billionaires through that sort of property. So that's the sort of world that I want to see. And I want to see those communities being caring for each other, being in kinship relations with all of life and living sustainably and regeneratively within their means where they give more than they take and they collaborate at whatever scale is required across whatever distance is required to achieve um, feats of science, feats of art that are part of human expression. So 
If you want to send a man, preferably a woman, to Mars, we can do that. We can still do science, we can still do art. We do not require debt, property, institutions or nation states to achieve either safe, flourishing communities or expressions of the power of human creativity. We simply don't need those things. And they've only existed for a small percentage of the history of humanity. Humanity has mostly lived in egalitarian local communities and that's where we're gonna go in the future, in my view. Or else we're gonna to go to join the many species that we have caused extinction for. Those are the choices as I see them. Thank you, Yen. I feel like not only have you presented us, you know, a vision worth fighting for, which I think is much needed in these times where there's so much of what's wrong, um, but also, you know, what you're proposing is radical, not in the sense of it being outlandish, but radical in its true sense, addressing the systems of violence at its root. Um, which I think is what is absolutely needed at this time, which I think is often elided in climate conversations where we don't want to talk about our political economy or our fundamental relationship to resources and property and um, institutions and debt. So I think I want to thank you for that. And I noticed that I've taken up a lot of time asking kind of my selfish questions, but uh, to kind of decentralize in the spirit of what we've been talking about, I think it's really important for me to open up the floor and see if there's folks who are present here who would like to pick your mind a little bit on something that is uh, curious to them. So what I will invite folks to do is if you have your video on, it would be great if you can kind of raise your hand and we can pass over the question to you. Um, or if you'd like to type it in the chat, one of us can read it out for sure. Um, but it would be great. We have about another 15 minutes or so with Yin. So if you can keep your question as concise as possible, that will be hugely helpful. But now I invite anyone else who would like to ask a question. Cairo, go ahead. What I have is very interesting. I'm not sure if I can express myself short, but I would try. Um, what I'm interested in is the process we, of this transition. And that's what, uh, where we are in trouble because those four, uh, those four uh, um, I don't know how to name it, that uh, property institution and nation states, they will not give power. Uh, they will not let them easily uh, disappear. Uh, so the, the last wave of nationalism and right-wing coalition, political coalitions and parties, and, uh, fascist groups uh, raising, that's the, the response to the, any attempt to change that. So I'm interested in the process, how to do that. Yeah, well, it's, first of all, it's not going to be a linear process. It's not going to be a process that we plan out one dot point at a time, because that's not how change happens. I mean, we live, it's important to remember that we live in, uh, in complex, um, chaotic, um, emergent systems. That's, that's how the world works. It's not how our societies work. That's how the world works. So we won't know exactly how to make these things happen. And we won't know exactly what our role is in making them happen when they have happened. We can only act ethically as best we can. So, I mean, people forget quickly, I think, even, even just in the history of modernity, you know, uh, the five great revolutions of modernity. I mean, do you think those, the people in France or Russia or the United States or England or China had any idea what was coming? They had no idea, you know, they did not know. People still cannot explain the collapse of the USSR after the fact. What happened? Why did it suddenly collapse? There's no good, really good, compelling explanation for why that happened. So we don't know how it's going to work. And there will be the backlash, absolutely, of, of right-wing fascist. Fascism is on the rise and it will continue to be on the rise. But we can combine that with very different parallel paths that people can can follow. So um, it's about 
doing what you can. You know, there's, there's, there's collective ways of living, for example. I live myself on an intentional community where nobody owns the land, nobody owns the house that they live in. All decisions are made collectively amongst 50 adults in a small community. So there's intentional communities is a way you can live. You can set up your life so you don't go into, you know, a lot of these things are privileges, of course. You know, um, one of the privileges that people in the global south already have is they're not consuming beyond the means of the planet. That's a privilege that we don't have in, in the global north. We need to take on board that privilege of giving more than we take. So there's, you know, the, the histories of being around for decades, of environmental uh, ideas of what's your impact on the planet? It's calculators online and so forth. You can fix that, some of that stuff. You can address some of that stuff. And some of this stuff does come from privilege, you know? What is the, what is the uh, potential opening of space from COVID that allows us to think about things like, essentially things that are happening right now, uh, ideas of universal basic income, for example, or job guarantees are becoming much more mainstream. Um, ideas of government spending uh, into the care economy, those sorts of things are becoming more palatable. I mean, people, even right-wing governments are doing some of these things without acknowledging them, certainly. They don't want to continue to do these things, but the reality is that, that, that the, the COVID um, pandemic is just the start of, of increasing number of intensifying disasters. And this will fracture the existing social configurations. The nation states will not survive uh, these sort of, we already have data from the OECD on the, on the rising, the, the rapid increase in failed nation states. This will continue to happen. So you'll, you'll handle, the nation states will be handled, don't worry. Their, their own conditions are creating the own conditions for their own demise. And we have to try and create these, this starts small, they're seeds, they start small, you know. Talking about this in social movements, the way you live, um, what you own, you know, do you own property that you rent to somebody else? Well, rent is unethical. So don't do it. If you happen to be that privileged, just don't do it. Don't make money off money. It's unethical. So there's what, if you know, if you're convinced there's things you can do and there's ways you can convince others in time, small and large ways every day, and often just through uh, modeling, you know, the best way that people see what they can do differently is through seeing what you do differently to them. It's not a matter of trying to con convince the most racist neighbor that you have next door. You don't need to convince, you need to show, demonstrate. So yeah, there's no, there's no simple answer and it's gonna be messy. It's gonna be the suffering. It's gonna, as people like, as, I, as you can say sometimes, it's gonna get a lot worse before it gets even more worse and then perhaps better. And uh, we just need to do all we can to avoid a vastly increased fascist, techno-surveillant uh, intensification of the nation state. We need to do as much as we can to avoid that. They will collapse, but we don't need to, to sort of um, wait around for that to happen. We need to act. And when that will hopefully um, give people a, a glimpse of a different, a different way of doing things, different way of existing. And hopefully, um, yeah, that these sort of pressures will, will have some sort of phase shift effect, some sort of strange attractor effect, some sort of influence in a chaotic system, which can be small. You know, some of the, some of the more, more recent revolutions were started by one person. You know, for example, um, if you look at the history of self-immolation, a single person who burns himself alive has created a number of massive social movements in the world. Now, you can't go outside and burn yourself alive and expect that to happen every time. That's not how it works. But we know that very small perturbations of chaotic systems can create massive changes. It's non-linear. It's emergent. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and I think it's linked to these visions of the future because clearly this is where our curiosity lies. Um, I'm wondering, maybe we can read out both questions and, and some 
there'll be an emergent answer that comes out of it uh, in the spirit of non-linearity. So Christy is asking, in this vision of the future, how can we support communities that are at some distance from ours who will suffer the most significantly at the front line of climate change, for example, food security? Uh, and Maddie is asking us, how can engaging with ecological limits invite us to relinquish modernity? Mm, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a good question. I think that um, the question about supporting communities at distance from us, I mean, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of connections that we have with those communities that are at distance from us. And most of those connections are, are quite parasitic, are quite vampiric, if you will. So we are constantly, in the global north, we are constantly draining resources from the global south in various ways and we need to stop doing that you know there's look into it look into the ways that happens and see what you can do to rearrange your life so that doesn't happen and then at the same time you can actually then try and give resources back to those people who are, are basically you know um are enslaved by the west you know to to meet our needs and we need to uh, emancipate and then we need to support. That can be the flow of resources, that can be uh, political lobbying to cancel third world debt, as it's called, um, to create a uh, global minimum wage. If we were to create a global minimum wage, the effects would be profound and very fast. Instead, we, we provide a small amount of aid to you know, starving children in Africa and meanwhile, suck enormous amounts of resources from those places that dwarf that aid. So there's many ways to think about supporting communities that are far distance. And the start of the supporting is to stop oppressing. So you move from oppressing, get to neutral, and then you can start supporting. Politically, economically, um, food security, yes, absolutely. You know, how can we um, increase our own local resilience and the capacity to provide our own food and therefore reduce pressure on others. And then what can we do to innovate, you know, as well, you know, innovation in, in, in permaculture, regenerative agriculture and spread those ideas to places that often, once again, are forced to do things in certain ways by multinational companies um, that are owned and run from the West. So yeah, there's many ways. How can engaging with ecological limits invite us to relinquish modernity? Well, you know, essentially just the idea of a limit is, is, is an affront to modernity. You know, there is no such thing as a limit. You know, this is unlimited growth we're talking about here. So if you engage with any sort of limit, if you, if you embrace ideas of um, frugality, um, frugal hedonism, for example, simplicity, sufficiency, um, then you'll start to see that actually there is enough for everybody in the world to live, um, to live lives that are worth living. And that the idea of scarcity, which is so fundamental to Western modes of economics, is actually, is actually an illusion. It's, it's, a, it's artificial scarcity that's created so that people have the conditions under which they will work for peanuts, doing bullshit jobs or creating bullshit widgets that nobody needs so that people who own companies and hedge fund managers can make billions of dollars, which they park in offshore tax havens and they do absolutely nothing with. So we're actually destroying the planet for the health of capital. Not anybody, just capital. So if we understand any sort of limit at all, then that will destroy modernity because we will stop. We will limit our own sense of consumption. We will share with others. We will limit our own sense of individuality. We will limit our own sense of comp competition with others that that creates uh, more, in, encourages and embeds the cycle of oppression. We will limit ourselves in those ways, but at the same time, we'll create radical abundance, abundance of cooperation, 
abundance of care, of kindness, of kinship, of love, of healing. These things are the truly infinite things in the world and they don't cost the earth. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like there's so many moments that we'll just have to come back to the recording and just hear again to fully internalize uh, the depth of what was said. Um, but it's, I think that was the stark kind of message that I've heard in the clearest way today is that we're, you know, we're destroying our planet for the health of capital. And I think that's something that's really powerful to remind ourselves whenever we imagine an alternative, there has to be an alternative to this. And there is, as you have kind of very clearly outlined for us today. Um, I'm wondering if there's maybe a final question within the crew here today, and I'll invite anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question before we invite second questions. Katrina, I see you've asked a question. Those of us who are privileged are scared and we are emotionally fragile, illiterate, incompetent, and we're entrenched in colonialism. Is there a way we can invite ourselves into more nourishing living through rediscovering belonging and relationship? And I think this may be just an invitation for us to talk about what do we do with privilege and what do we do with the fragility of privilege in all of its many different forms? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, um, there is a fragility around privilege. In fact, I had a, a very interesting um, meta, meta moment the other day when I was talking to a large um, public good NGO in Australia and, I, and they said, um, I told them about this, you know, modernity and coloniality. And they said, what about right, white fragility? And I said, well, I didn't mention white people in my talk at all. So why are you being fragile about white fragility as a white person? You don't need to talk about identity politics. You know, this is not about, we, we need to move beyond identitarian divisions. It doesn't help anybody. We all enmeshed in this system. You know, we're all enmeshed in coloniality in different ways, in different positions, on different meanderings along the landscape of society. And it creates, yeah, enormous suffering and trauma. And so the first step is to, as always, to recognize um, the predicament that you're in. And once you recognize it, you're still going to keep making the same mistakes, but you'll be more conscious of those mistakes. And then you might be able to change one small thing in your life for the better. And then perhaps something else. But really importantly of all, and that's the question has the answer within it. You know, it's not an individual journey. It's a journey first and foremost about creating community, about fostering, nourishing, cultivating community. You know, this is not an individual journey. That's what capitalism wants us to think. That's what neoliberalism tells us that we're individual rational agents competing with each other. We're not, and we never have been. We're deeply deeply dependent on each other and the living ecosystems of the world. You know, it's no accident that all the philosophical treaties uh, from Western white male heterosexual propertied men start with an adult human on an island. Here's an adult man on an island. Now, how does he interact with society? Let me just explain to you that you probably realize humans start as babies. And once you understand that, and once you, of course, know already how incredibly dependent human babies are, that's the human condition. The human condition is not a fully grown adult male sprung from the earth on an island somewhere, who then has to join society somehow as an individual, rational, competitive agent. It's, it's absolute rubbish. Humans are dependent from birth, and we remain dependent throughout our lives. So we need to build community and those communities, we need to support each other in those communities. And, and if we continue to share and to deepen our kinship relations with each other and all of life, that's, that's it. That's it for capitalism. It's done for. It can't handle that sort of thing. Thank you 
Thank you so much. I, I've written down next time I get the kind of mail on an island argument from someone to remind everyone, you know, we are interdependent. We are a social community-based species. And so it's really important to know that the work also therefore lies within the community, not the individual. That's what we are kind of being perhaps indoctrinated to believe in this time. Um, I see one final question and I actually wonder if Christy, you'd like to ask this question yourself um, and then maybe we will uh, kind of bring the session to a close here today. Yeah, um, thanks Ian so much, it's been amazing. I just wanted to point out the beautiful language thing that you've been using, that I've been hearing such as singing, I wanna sing that in or when you were um, talking about future or visioning. So I just wanted to hear your um, singing in of the ab Aboriginal perspective of songline and, and just from a cultural perspective. Yeah, yeah. So uh, singing is so important. Singing, dancing, painting, expression of all forms. You know, we, one of the problems in, in the West is that we're, we're very focused on vision. You know, we think everything is about vision and there's a lot more to the world than vision. Um, or hearing for that matter, which is a sort of second place to vision. We've got we to gotta feel that where we are. We've got to sense the kind of um, the place that we are standing on, but the place that we also are moving through, skipping, hopping, dancing, and sometimes limping through life. You know, this, this is an embodied world. We are embodied creatures. We are not um, some sort of mind that sits about here. You know, we feel ourselves here. We're not here. We're everywhere. We're everywhere here and we're everywhere there. We are everything connected together, embodied, interdependent, sensuous, sacred. And part of that, that learning to be in excess of ourselves, to be beside ourselves, to be more than ourselves, but also to be more ourselves at the same time, is to connect with country. And song spirals or song lines are simply about singing country. So singing country into existence, as country sings us into existence, constantly, always regenerating, refreshing, recreating, not exactly the same, but more in excess. And so to feel that, that connection, that, that expansion of the self, you know, that dissolving of the self. We fall into each other, we fall into country. And by falling down, we are, we are strengthened. We become greater, more, not in a hierarchical way, but in excess of ourselves. And so there's many ways to connect to country and you know, learning about about country, about wildlife, about animals, about ecosystems, um, in a sense, um, becoming wild again, you know, rewilding themselves is so important because part of capitalist uh, cosmologies is that capturing that domestication of the human to convince us that this is all we are when we are, we are multitudes. We are so much, so, so much more than the domestic captured um, captivated audience consumers that we are called to be by capitalism. We need to be called by country to exceed these things. And that's what song spirals are about. Thank you so much, Ian. It feels like, thank you feels like to bland a word to be really using in this moment. Um, I feel like it has been an incredible gift to our community and a joy and a privilege to be speaking with you here today. And um, really that call to rewild ourselves, that call to be called to country um, is something I'm going to carry. Uh, with me as I move forward into this week and hopefully for the rest of my life. It really is an invitation for me to 
radically reimagined so much. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, we will definitely maybe be, you know, we'll be sharing the recording out. We thank everyone for coming here today. The invitation is to stay back if folks would like to um, have a little bit of a listening exchange within breakout rooms, which is a tradition within the dialogues is not that we just extract, but also that we kind of give in and, and give back to each other and have a space where we can really contemplate what we've heard. So um, I guess I would like to invite Christy to help us with those breakout rooms. And before we do that, once again, maybe just all of us who can, to thank you for being here today and uh, all that you've offered into this space. Thank you so, so much. And please feel welcome to stay in if, if you have time and please, it's all um, whatever you need. Very beautiful, thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to do the breakout rooms. Breakouts where we actually get to hear from everyone. Uh, one thing that they're happy to take away with them from this space. Um, and if you would prefer not to be recorded, feel free to share your learning on the chat. That's more than welcome as well. Um, but maybe I can just check in to see how that was. Was that uh, helpful to have that time in the breakout rooms? Yeah. Um, well, we'd love to hear what was part of that conversation. And, and maybe if someone is willing to kick us off, um, I'll invite someone to speak into the space. I can name names, but I would love if it could be more in line with when people are ready to speak. Yeah, Maddie, am I seeing a hand? No, that was a scratch. Welcome, Tom. We're just doing a round of checkouts where we're sharing one thing that we are taking away from listening to Yin and speaking in our breakout rooms today. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I, I got thrown out of the meeting when the breakout rooms closed. So yeah, yeah. Would you like to start us off, Tom, not to put you on the spot or anything? We're just um, hoping to kick off this round of checkouts. Um, okay. Um, so just, so just checking out just, yeah, look, it's, it's a, it's a privilege to be in the, in the a conversation around these, these topics where we look so closely at what, what the visions, what, 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 you know, constructive visions of how to live totally, totally differently um, to take account of where we've come from way, way back in, in small, you know, I think the think of our history in, with small hunter gatherer societies and, um, and, uh, you know, how we, we, we bring the, the, um, some of those characteristics into our future, not, not, not to go back to that, but to, 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 to bring that sort of communality. But look, I'm, I'm sorry, I diverge I'm taking up too much time. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and, uh, and I really thank Yin for all his work he's done and um, Christy and Kavya, who I understand have organized um, this session. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Tom. Would you like to pass it on? Um, yes, can I pass to Christy? Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, thank you, Yin, for um, coming along and, and sharing what you've learned in your life journey and, and dedicating yourself to and bringing your being um, to the call. I could really feel that or I'm feeling it um, even through Zoom. Um, and Kavi, I like such a considered and graceful and delicate way of um, yarning and, and speaking as an interview. It was such a pleasure to be in the space and thank you everyone for coming on and I'll pass to Katrina. Mm. Thank you everybody yeah um, Christy and Kavya and, and Yin and every all, all of you um, yeah so good so affirming in so many ways and also challenging um, yeah, it feels affirming 
because I, yeah, want to put my life and my attention towards supporting our emotional capacity to be connected um, as, as an activist, like doing, doing that as activism. Um, yeah. And yeah, like where that could lead to <laughs> and where that needs to lead to as well. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, the fact that, that, that our colonial system and our colonial heads make it so hard. Mm. Yeah, and honour for the difficulty of that, you know, the privilege and the lack of privilege in our stuckness. The, 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 the lack of privilege in the stuckness of those of us who are privileged. <laughs> yeah, um, stuckness and disconnectedness. Um, yeah, I'll pass to Caro. Yeah, our discussion and the breakout rooms was also for me fruitful as as much fruitful as the the dialogue with Ian between Kavya and Ian. And what stacks with me stuck sticks with me is the impact for my personal life of all this transition and that I probably will not see in my life the fruits of this transition so I need to adapt find happiness in my life um, not from achieving the goals but from the this journey finding happiness in this journey not in the uh, final uh, mm -hmm. goal of this journey so that's what sticks with me yeah, and I pass to uh, Kavya. It's truly been a joy and privilege to be here with all of you today. I feel like I'm going to be replaying this conversation quite literally in the recording, but also in my mind for the days to come and share it with some of my friends who couldn't be here today because I think what I'm affirmed to take with me today is you know, decolonization is this really deep, deep, deep process. It's an outer process, it's an inner process, and it is continuous and often nonlinear. And to stick with it is like an ethic. It's a commitment much more than a single act. Um, that's what I'm really holding with me today. I'll pass it to you, Maddie. Thank you, Kavya. Um... Yeah, I think I just want to start off with gratitude for, for Kavya and Christy. Kavya, I'm, I'm always deeply inspired by the ways in which you hold space and engage in conversation. And Yin, it was such an honor to be here. As, as the daughter of a midwife, I recognize a portal when I see one. And I'm excited to dance through this one. I'm excited to be in conversation in ways that don't... Or let's be more life affirming, to be in conversation in ways that enable us to move towards life, towards more possibilities than less. And the deep acknowledgement that there's many different ways and paths that we get there, but that we're all really in it together. Um, a lot of appreciation. I see that Nella has offered her checkout in the chat. And so maybe I'll go on ahead and pass it over to you, Yin. Thank you, Lily. It's been uh, uplifting to have this, um, this conversation. I feel that uh, this is another manifestation of community, of growing community in the world. And community doesn't have to be just people that you live next to. It's much more than that. We're creating these global communities of people who can sit differently with the trouble of modernity. And in that way, 
to trouble modernity in different ways. And it's beautiful. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I would like to read Mila's checkout, if that's okay, since we haven't uh, given it the space yet. Um, so Neela writes, thank you for the dialogue and the opportunity to talk in the breakout rooms. Some words that I take with me, go slowly, create parallel alternatives, do the work in communities, and then there's the privilege and how it's in and around us. It's huge, we're deep in it. I'm a bit overwhelmed, it's kind of sinking in, even if only a drop, and I'm silent. And I want to thank you all for that. And I think that says it more than anything else. Thank you for being here. And just as a reminder, as a part of our closing rituals, we will be continuing the conversation next week at the exact same time. We know that there was a bit of a mix up with some of the time zones that we'll try and make clear in our next round of advertising. But we're going to be speaking with Victor Lee Lewis uh, about race and co-liberation and visions for the future as we did today. Um, and he's speaking kind of from the North American context uh, and he'll be joining us super late in his night and we're extremely appreciative for that. Once again, thank you. And we hope to see you very soon. Thank you once again, Ian. Thank you.